Can you think of an example of a smooth surface? I'd like you to think of one right now. Think of something really, really smooth. Maybe you thought of an ice skating rink, or a glossy countertop, or a baby's bottom. But all those things are only comparatively smooth. If you looked at them in a microscope, you'd find that they're kind of not smooth. Not really at all. Welcome to Flip Physics. Today we're going to talk about friction, and not the kind between you and your girlfriend where you've said something awkward. No, I mean real friction. The kind of friction that's everywhere. And friction really is everywhere. You might think that an ice skating rink is smooth, but the very fact that you can walk on it at all tells you there must be some friction. You can push against the ice and move forward. If there was no friction, you would always slip. You would just be stuck in one spot. You wouldn't be able to get any purchase at all. If you look at any surface under a microscope, you'd find a landscape of peaks and valleys hills and pits, all kinds of knobbly rough areas, even on a seemingly smooth surface. Here's a question, if you fill a shopping cart with all kinds of things, so it's really full and heavy, is it easier to get the shopping cart moving, or easier to keep it moving? Or is it the same? If you're not sure, next time you go to the supermarket, try it for yourself. The hard part really is getting it moving. Once you get it moving, it takes a lot less effort to keep it going. And that's because there are two types of friction. When an object is sat on a surface, there's something called adhesion between the surfaces. Surfaces are a little bit sticky. It's because those peaks and troughs get kind of stuck in each other a little bit. So there's some stickiness that kind of holds it together. But once you overcome that and start moving, it becomes a lot easier. Although so far we've been using FF to represent friction, we're now going to split it up into the two types. Still objects have what we call static friction. So for static friction, we can use FS. Moving objects have what we call kinetic friction. So for that, we're going to use FK. Static means still, kinetic means moving. Kinetic friction, as a rule, is weaker than static friction. Here's a graph which illustrates that. It shows applied force plotted against the frictional force. When you first push an object, like a table for example, very lightly, it won't move at all. That's because the more you push, the stronger static friction gets to counter your push. Eventually, if you push hard enough, friction can no longer keep up and the table starts to move. At that moment, the amount of friction shoots down because static friction is instantly replaced with the weaker kinetic friction. Whereas you needed this much force to get the thing moving in the first place, you only need this much force to keep it moving. This applet shows that very well. I'll include the link in the description and I encourage you to play around with it. We see here that the frictional force is matching your pushing force until it starts moving and then the frictional force suddenly shoots down as it's replaced with kinetic friction. So we can calculate this frictional force using this equation. F represents the force of friction that we're trying to calculate. The Greek letter mu is what's called the coefficient of friction. It's just a number that represents how rough the two surfaces are against each other. Rougher surfaces will have a higher coefficient of friction, and it's always somewhere between 0 and 1. And Fn is the normal reaction force of the surface. If the surface is level, that will usually be equal to mg. On a slope, we have to figure out the component of mg going into the slope. So usually with a slope, you'll end up plugging in mg sine theta into there. But never mind that for the moment. It's important to realize that you can use this equation for both static friction and kinetic friction. When any two surfaces are in contact with each other, there will be a coefficient of static friction between those two surfaces that represents how rough they are and how hard it is to get, them, get one object moving against the other. But there will also be a coefficient of kinetic friction, which represents how hard it is to keep the objects moving against each other. So if you use this equation with the coefficient of static friction, you're calculating the static frictional force, or if you use the equation with the coefficient of kinetic friction, you'll be able to calculate the kinetic frictional force. The end part, the normal force, is gonna be the same either way. Those coefficients of static and kinetic friction, you can only figure out using experiments. You can do experiments with two materials rubbing together and figure out what the coefficient of static friction between the two are, and figure out what the coefficient of kinetic friction between the two are. Those are also the kind of numbers that you can look up in data booklets, although each actual sample of a material is a little bit different. No two coffee tables are the same. One important thing to notice here is that the normal force is in this equation. Since bigger objects tend to produce larger normal forces, they push against surfaces harder, so the surface tends to push back against them harder. That tells you that friction is going to be stronger for heavier objects, which makes sense. If you're moving house, it's much easier to push a bookcase along the floor than it is to push a grand piano. There's also the issue of inertia. From Newton's second law, we know that in general, it also takes more force to accelerate larger objects. So when you put those two things together, it's no wonder that it's hard to move a grand piano. 
Last message I want to give you today, friction is powerful. If you have any doubt of this, try interleaving the pages of a phone book. The amount of friction between two pages in a phone book is not that much, but the total friction from all those pages together becomes so huge that you can't separate the books no matter how hard you try. <sighs> okay, let's do this. Do -do -do -do. Well, the witness is right and the lawyer's a liar The future looks bright like a four-alarm fire An old man pictures a robin's egg falling Crushed underfoot as he limps through his last did it. Look at this. There are no screws and staples here. This is all friction. Whatever I do, I just can't get them apart. Urgh, come on. As the Mythbusters found out on one of their episodes, two phone books take huge forces to break them apart. They ended up pulling on the phone box with two huge tanks. Friction is pretty amazing. And friction is interesting as a concept. You can't possibly avoid it. If you move even the slightest bit, you have friction. You've got friction between you and the air molecules. You've got friction between you and the floor. If you didn't have friction, you wouldn't be able to do anything. But then if you had less friction, it would be easier to move. These inherent contradictions have made friction a fantastic analogy for some of the issues we have in the world. Take Saul Alinsky, for example. Here's what he said about friction. Change means movement. Movement means friction. Only in the frictionless vacuum of a non-existent abstract world can movement or change occur without that abrasive friction of conflict. Movement and resistance. The world is full of contradictions like these. It's a hard to understand, messy place. And maybe if we all understood our place in this messy, frustrating universe, it might put us all on the level where we could solve a few of these problems. Thanks for watching Flip Physics. Feel free to like and subscribe, but most of all, leave a comment below with your questions, thoughts, and suggestions. You can also go to flipphysics.net for some materials. Until next time, keep questioning. Friction might be powerful, but it's no match for a leaf on the wind. Watch how I saw.